Okay, when we're talking about severe thunderstorms, what makes a thunderstorm severe? Two main factors, large hail and damage and wind gusts. So we're looking at when we have a severe thunderstorm, we're talking about hail that is quarter size or larger. That is one inch in diameter. So if you uh, coins for reference is a great thing to use. So once it gets up to quarter size, you can put that hailstone in your hand. And if it's a quarter or larger, that's considered severe hail. The other main factor element, uh, severe winds, 58 miles per hour or greater. And again, that is rounded up to 60 miles per hour. Always be weather ready. Sign up for alerts. Be prepared. Again, as always, remember a watch means be on the lookout. Severe weather is possible in and close to a watch area. A warning means take action. Severe weather is likely or imminent. Be prepared to take cover immediately in your safe place. Heavy rain can lead to standing water, and although you may be tempted to jump into that muddy mess, you may want to think twice before you touch. Joshua Fu, Chancellor Professor at the University of Tennessee, says lots of things can be found in standing water. A lot of the, the bacteria, virus, and also uh, uh, different uh, microorganisms, and that causes uh, like small children, the diarrhea, vomitings, and so on, or uh, the skin rush. He recommends playing in moving water rather than standing water because it's less likely to grow certain bacteria. Now, if you, your kiddos, or your pets find yourself in the middle of a murky mess, it's recommended to wash up and avoid putting your hands in your mouth or eyes. We are not recommended that too close to those are standing water. Uh, so we need to use pumping out of the waters. On any given year, on average, about 150 people are injured from lightning strikes in the United States. And over the past 30 years, on average, 36 people die from lightning strikes each year. And here are the activities they do when they're killed. You want to make sure that you take some proper precautions and not be one of these statistics. So if outside and there's lightning, what do you do? What's your best move? Well, don't get under trees. Trees, tall objects, poles attract lightning so you could really be injured if not killed if you stay under a tree other things you need to be doing run to a building or car is the best move stay away from open fields stay away from water very good conductor of electricity if in a building in your home well is it still safe we just told you to go inside well mostly you got to do a few things stay away from any windows keep the windows closed lightning will not go through the window the reason you have to stay away is that window could shatter due to lightning maybe the percussion and it could injure you. Also, don't be touching anything plugged into an outlet. Electricity can travel down there. Don't be in the shower, taking a bath or doing dishes. Water is a good conductor of electricity. It can go through the pipes in your house. After 30 minutes since you've heard thunder, it's safe to go outside. Well, in a vehicle, is it safe? Well, it is. A vehicle protects you with all that metal. It transfers the electricity to the ground. Just keep the windows closed and don't be touching any of the metal objects within the car. Do you know how to tell how far away a thunderstorm is? The distance of a thunderstorm away from you? Well, there's a way you can tell. A little bit of math involved. Let's talk about it. Okay, so here's a thunderstorm. The first thing that you will notice in general, besides the dark and threatening clouds, is lightning. That's the first thing that happens in a thunderstorm as far as one of some of the actual elements that we experience. Lightning comes first and then thunder. Now, once you see the lightning, you can count the number of seconds, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, etc., until you hear the thunder. For example, if I'm at this house location right here and I get to about five seconds, five seconds equals one mile, etc., etc. So if I get to 10 seconds, that equals about two miles. All right, so let's talk about it a little bit further. What if the thunderstorm is really far off? There's still a way to count. So again, lightning comes first and then thunder. So I see the lightning. I'm waiting to hear the thunder, but if it's more than about 10 miles away, I may not ever hear that thunder. Some folks would call that heat lightning, but guess what? There's no such thing as heat lightning. It is a thunderstorm that is producing lightning and thunder but here's the key. This is the science part of it. Light travels much faster than the speed of sound. So my eyes see the lightning way off in the distance. A lot of times this happens in the summertime, but if I never hear the thunder, that simply means the thunderstorm is too far away in the distance 
and I just didn't hear it. No such thing as heat lightning. It's an actual thunderstorm way off in the distance. Now you know. There are many types of lightning, such as spider, sheet, cloud to cloud, intracloud, and cloud to ground lightning, just to name a few. However, the most common is intracloud, which can be visually spectacular, but it's far less dangerous than a cloud to ground strike. Now, most lightning that strikes the ground typically begins in the lower part of the cloud when a large pool of negative charges builds above an area of positive charges. When the imbalance becomes too great, electricity is discharged in a bright flash of light. However, the flash is only the return stroke. The first stroke cannot be seen and starts to form from the negatively charged part of the cloud, zigzagging toward an increasing pool of positive charges. Once the opposite charges meet, an electrical current starts to flow upward at about 60,000 miles per second. Therefore, most lightning starts from the cloud, travels down to create a channel that allows an electrical discharge to travel back to the cloud. The reverse can happen, but ground to cloud lightning is quite rare. Lightning can either be negative, which is the most common, or positive, which makes up 5% of all cloud to ground strikes. Unlike negative lightning, positive lightning begins from the upper reaches of the cloud. A positive strike is considered more dangerous because 1 million volts can be discharged, which is 10 times stronger than the average negative strike. Positive lightning is also able to strike up to 20 miles from the cloud beneath a clear blue sky. Because it seems to come out of nowhere, a positive strike is often called a bolt from the blue. Lastly, some lightning can travel much, much farther, although very rare. In 2020, a strike was recorded that traveled over 477 miles across three states. Take a nickel and flip it on its side. That's how much water it takes to make your car hydroplane. One twelfth of an inch. When it starts raining, you have to pick the right speed for right now. That's the nice way of saying slow down from Craig Smith, owner of Drive Right Driving School. Anything over 35 miles an hour, you're probably water skiing in your car. You are five times more likely to get into a crash during wet weather. So here are things to look out for to alert you to take caution. Look for any standing water on the road. If it's raining, is the water splashing or rippling? If yes, it's enough to lose traction. Listen for water sloshing under your tires. That means there's too much water that your tires can't push away. And if the steering wheel starts pulling in another direction, you're hydroplaning. Hold your wheel steady, maintain the direction you're heading, and release the gas to regain control. If you need to pull off the road because the rain is too much, get as far off the road as possible. Preferably at the next exit or thoroughfares like Clinton, Chapman, or Asheville highways have parking lots you can pull into. If you can't exit the highway, you can get behind a guardrail. Once you're safe, then turn on your flashers. But if you're going to power through rainy conditions, keep your hazard lights off. Leave your regular lights on. Uh, don't run your hazard flashers if you're going down the road. If you feel like you need to have your hazard flashers, get all the way over somewhere safe and turn them on. Smith has an acronym that can keep you safe in any bad road condition. Read the road. R, right speed for right now, so slow down on messy roads. E, eyes up, brain on. Put away distractions and stay alert. A, anticipate their next move, referring to the cars around you. And D, donut of space. Surrounding yourself with space can give you the time you need for fast decisions. Out of Knoxville, I'm Tavian Whitehurst. This colorful map behind me shows the number of tornadoes by county between 1950 and 2023. Now McMinn County, Cumberland and Fentress may stand out to you because they're colored in red. A lot of that has to do with how the storms enter our viewing area. We typically have strong storms in Middle Tennessee that work their way onto our plateau counties, weakening as they get to the east. That's why we have some of those higher numbers in Cumberland and Fentress. And we also tend to have strong storms when they come up from the southwest and work their way up the eastern side of the valley. That's why you see those higher numbers from McMinn, Monroe, Blunt, and even into Knox County here. As far as when the tornadoes occur during the year, the most common time is during the spring severe weather season from March, April, May into June. But we do have a secondary severe weather season, especially when it comes to tornadoes in the fall in October and in November. As far as the ratings with these, we often don't have 
very strong tornadoes here across East Tennessee. The majority of our tornadoes come as EF0, EF1, or EF2, but that doesn't make them any less dangerous. You still have to act when a tornado warning is issued. Part of what makes tornadoes in East Tennessee so dangerous is because a lot of them occur at night. When we look at the time of day of when these tornadoes typically occur, it's usually between about 4 and 8 p.m., but notice those bars that go into the overnight hours from midnight all the way into the early morning. A lot of those occur after dark due to the climatology and just the time of day that these storms arrive, and that makes them all that much more dangerous. So as we head into our spring severe weather season, make sure you have multiple ways to receive those weather alerts. When it comes to severe weather season, the best way to not be scared is to be prepared, and especially when it comes to any strong storms that could potentially produce a tornado. Let's talk a little bit more about where's the safe place to go if there is the potential for seeing any tornado activity within some of these storms. In your house in particular, the best place to go is going to be the innermost portion of your house on the lowest level possible. So you want to avoid all outside walls if you can do this and all outside windows. This could potentially be a hallway, a closet, a bathroom, an area that you can designate in your house as being that safe place during any severe weather. And within that place, you can also have uh, some, uh, some certain items like a flashlight, a blanket, uh, a, a radio that's going to provide you with the very latest information on some of the storms moving through. Areas that you want to avoid include top floor rooms as well as exterior walls with windows in place. That's going to really be an area where there could be the potential for some flying debris. One place not to go again. You do not want to go outside when we have any severe weather in place. We're going to have much more over on our website. If you're not in your house, where to go if severe weather strikes and also we'll be sure to keep you updated day to day with any severe weather that is possible throughout the rest of the season. Today's topic for Severe Weather Awareness Week is severe thunderstorms. And severe thunderstorms can produce large hail like was seen in this picture behind us, Cass. Yeah, because it doesn't fall just straight from the sky. It can blow sideways and damage homes as well as make a mess of your cars. Oh my goodness, what size hail can do that type damage and what size hail creates damage? We're going to demonstrate that for you right now. Yeah, let's go ahead and walk through this. We'll start with what is the basic size for a severe thunderstorm and that yeah. is going to be a quarter. What you got, a quarter? Oh, huh. Okay, looks like it'll be sunny tomorrow. No, All we right. don't use that for forecasting. Thank you. We Cass. also can have Put a ping pong ball. Right oh, okay, yes. Maybe ping a pong golf ball. ball. Yes. Golf ball. All right, soft hands, Todd. Okay. Soft hands. Eggs, Eggs are about two inches in diameter. Two that inches. can make a mess. Yes. Soft hands. Good job, Todd. I'm okay. not going to put that in my Then pocket. we move up to a tennis Finger. ball. Let's see, two and a half inches okay. in diameter right there. Tennis ball. We've okay. had baseball size hail in 2011, April 27th. That's what made cars look like this in oh, Knox County. Oh, my goodness. County. So we can demonstrate on our monitor what would happen. Not going to do that either. Go ahead, guys. Oh my gosh, we also have up to three inch in diameter a teacup or an apple. Goodness gracious. And then we've had this. This could be a softball, a large orange, or a grapefruit up to uh, four and a half inches in diameter. Largest hail we've had here in East Tennessee. Goodness gracious, I can't really juggle. I can try. <laughs> Let's see. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. All I know is okay. I don't want any of those objects falling from the sky in yeah. my home, myself, or my car. Oh my goodness. That's a great demonstration, Cass. Thank you for pulling out of the hail box, the different hail side. 